most enjoyable planning experiences has been when I worked with the owners of a very successful franchise business. Uh, Mom and Dad owned a company and after years of being in the company had decided that they were ready to sell the company and they engaged an investment banking firm to procure a appropriate buyer for them and in the beginning of that process realized that they need to also address their estate planning with this sale. They engaged my firm to review their current estate plan, to review the sales transaction and the impact that that sales transaction was going to have upon their estate plan. Well the challenge we had here is a very traditional challenge. Uh, very large, large, very large estate uh, values with large estate taxes. A good problem to have. And then also another challenge with us at this was that dad was not in good health. So what we did as our solution is that we implemented a multi-step family transaction prior to the sale of the company. An ethical will is a will that allows you to pass on your values, your hopes, your dreams, your wishes to your family. Your regular will and your trust are designed to pass on your stuff, but this will is a lot more personal and it offers the opportunity for clients to really tell their family how they feel about something. It could be how they feel about religion, how they feel about their relationship with their child or their sibling. And it's really the opportunity to do something very special for their family. And I had a client that I wrote an ethical will for and he really, really was moved by the content of the document. And it, it almost brought him to tears. Um, he, he really appreciated uh, having that document for his family. One of the clients that I have right now that is in a similar situation to what my, my dad, uh, same age group and everything, um, has a small child and is married, is to make sure that he's got a buy-sell agreement with his partner and that he's got that fully funded with life insurance and that he never lets that lapse before a new policy is in place. And we have worked really hard to make sure that all those little mistakes that happened in my dad's situation don't happen to clients like this. Now the land involved is all dedicated um, for philanthropic purposes anyway, whether it's for a yeshiva or a synagogue or low-income housing. So it's all being used for charitable purposes, but it has high value, low dollars associated with it. So the clients are extremely happy that they'll get to keep the land, the land will be in the family foundation, and they'll still get to continue with their philanthropic causes. So we have a strategy that we use called opportunity shifting. And opportunity shifting is where we get a business owner at the early stages of a business or an investment and we move it into a special type of trust that will be excluded from his estate for estate tax purposes and creditors can't take it away if there's ever a legal problem. So I worked with the client, we set up all the entities and trusts, we got the business transferred in before any of the oil refineries were functional. What we did is we got the asset moved out of his estate before the huge increase in value. A couple of clients came in, a husband and wife, and husband was the more dominant partner. And it was very, very clear that his chief goal was to make sure that his wife was cared for, both financially and that the right people were doing it. And over time, she developed dementia and he became ill. And the family tells me that in his last days, he expressed great satisfaction and peace by knowing that his wife was cared for and that the right people were looking after her. And that's exactly the case. After he died, she had tremendous care from those people for the rest of her life. With the use of several charitable remainder unit trusts, we were able to eliminate estate taxes and provide their children with a stream of income during their lifetime while still achieving their parents' faith-based eternal legacy objective. This legacy plan also served to leave a lasting imprint on their children's lives which would serve as a vivid reminder of how passionate their parents were with regard to faith-based initiatives. Another case that we had was a similar situation. It was a uh, um, 
an unmarried heterosexual couple, um, and uh, fairly early, fairly young actually, in their early 50s, um, they did some planning um, with no really expectation that they were ill or anything, but within a year, uh, the, uh, the, the man in the, in, the, in the couple, he died, and uh, unexpectedly, and according to the terms of the trust, everything went to his um, partner, and uh, um, we avoided probate, and everything went to her, and she was able to uh, um, live as, the, as they intended without any issue. Uh, it was a very simple process, and she was extremely thankful, and uh, um, really could not thank me enough for the planning that I did. What plans have you made for in the future when you're not going to be able to take care of such a big house? You know, what, what have you thought of doing in the future and, and what timetable are you looking at? And Amy's mother laughed and said to me, Oh honey, she goes, we're too young to think about that. She's 77, her husband is 81. She said, I'm middle-aged. And I said, no. I said, really, it's unreasonable to think that you're going to live to age 154, which is half of 77. I said, you're really not middle-aged. And we have to come up with a plan now. Let's work on this now so that we're not doing crisis planning. Unlike uh, other people, they have a, a, a unique challenge in estate planning. Um, not only do, are they talking about planning for their, their family, their loved ones, but they have a business which has generally been passed down to them over several generations, a legacy, if you will. Um, the, the importance of, of that uh, to their family goes beyond simple assets like a mutual fund or an insurance policy. This is a way of life for, uh, for people in agriculture, and they have a responsibility of stewardship um, to the generations who passed it down to them to the generations in the future. We have family meetings and we serve as the interpreters for the family to say look this is what mom and dad did and this is why they did it and this is how it benefits you and if you have any questions ask them now so there's no surprises later on because it's not going to be easy to go through and we want to make this transition as easy as possible. Write a letter to your family and, and tell them that you love them. You may not get a chance to do that again. Um, tell them the things that made your family great. Tell them the things how the wealth was built and what that really means to your family as a legacy that's going to last for generations. Because if we don't do that, you know, it's not going to be there for people that really care we care about. We agreed among ourselves how um, the proceeds of the life insurance should be split up, some for the surviving widow and some for the remaining partners to um, not only pay themselves back for the money they had injected into the company, but also for the ongoing operation of the company. I think the good news in this story and, um, and why it turned out to be a success was that we did have a written set of um, buy-sell agreements, so everybody ultimately knew what to expect even though the um, initial expectation was misplaced. And um, we avoided litigation and ultimately everybody went away um, feeling like they had um, successfully been a winner in this um, particular situation. I'm Meryl Bailey. I'm an estate planning attorney and I have the best job in the world. Every single day I help people in my own neighborhood make decisions that make their life better. I am one of seven children and my parents are much older than the parents of my peers. And I became an estate planning attorney because I realized that I was coming up with issues with my parents with aging that my friends and my siblings and I were completely unprepared to, to handle. When my parents got older, the one and only professional who ever spoke to them about the fact that they may not at some point be safe living in their own home was their physician. My father was furious. My mother realized the wisdom of that discussion. So I make it a point when I'm meeting with my clients, no matter what their age, to discuss with them that at some point in the future, they may not be safe living in their own home. One of the benefits of living in a small town is that a lot of my clients are the parents of my friends from high school. And recently, my friend Amy had sent her parents in to meet with me. Now, I've known these people since I was a teenager. 
And I said, I realize you're living in the same home you lived in when I knew you 30 years ago, in the big house with four bedrooms and four bathrooms with the tennis court and the pool on the lake with the jet ski and the hot tub and the motorboat. And I said, what plans have you made for in the future when you're not going to be able to take care of such a big house? You know, what, what have you thought of doing in the future and, and what timetable are you looking at? And Amy's mother laughed and said to me, oh honey, she goes, you're too young to think about that. She's 77, her husband is 81. She said, I'm middle-aged. And I said, no, I said, really, it's unreasonable to think that you're gonna to live to age 154, which is half of 77. I said, you're really not middle-aged and we have to come up with a plan. Now, let's work on this now so that we're not doing crisis planning. They were shocked. They hadn't expected the conversation to go there. So I said, what, you know, what did you think this would ever happen? And they said, oh, well, we would assume we'd move in with Amy. You know, she's got that big, big space over the garage. I don't know what developer ever thought that calling the space over a garage is an in-law space. It is typically accessed by this very narrow, steep staircase. So I reminded her that that's how you got up to the space above Amy's garage. And I said that if mobility issues, which are one of the primary reasons why people move out of their home, is why they're going to be moving out, they certainly couldn't move into some place that was only accessed by a staircase. I then asked them if the reasons they're moving out is that they're going to be needing help with the activities of daily living, did they really want their daughter to help them with dressing, with bathing, with their bathroom habits? And again, they had never thought of this before. I said, are you willing to let her do that? Is she willing to do it? I mean, I know Amy, she loves her parents, but this is a dynamic that I don't think a lot of people have thought through. They left that day, it was a really great conversation, and soon after I got a call from my friend Amy who said, oh, I'm so glad that you talked to them about this because I can't, as the daughter, I can't have that conversation. And she said that they are looking at their alternatives. I had discussed with them bringing home into their, uh, help into their home. But one of the problems with bringing help into your home that the elders don't think through sometimes is that you become a hostage in your own home. The more people you bring in, the less often you go out and you're at the vagaries of someone else's schedule. In addition, with the, an adult child or someone has to manage all that care. And I know before we moved my parents into assisted living, that I was spending at least 40 hours a week managing their care. And that, it was an incredible burden and, and I wasn't sleeping. So one of the other things I learned when, from my parents' experience is when they did move into assisted living, they had several great years. They regained a lot of independence that they didn't, that they didn't realize they had given up because when I was going over to their house or one of my siblings to take them where they needed to go because we had already taken away their car keys, which is a completely different discussion we can have another day. They were at my schedule when it was convenient for me to take them to the grocery store or for me to take them to the mall or for me to take them wherever I wanted them to go at that time. So my parents regained that independence. My friend Amy's parents now have their house on the market. They are excited about the new chapter in their life and they're looking forward to it. I learned about these tools and discussing these things through my colleagues at Wealth Council, through the educational events that Wealth Council provides and through discussions on the listserv and in the in-person meetings. It's been invaluable. Thank you.